18 years ago, I sat in the mayor's office and an assistant city manager, we were talking about how to revitalize old neighborhoods, inner city neighborhoods. Really beautiful neighborhoods like Heritage Hills, Mesa Park, Crown Heights, and, and others, Gatewood. And uh, assistant city manager, Joe Van Buller, said, Mayor, you can put nice parks in those neighborhoods, you can put nice entryways, street lights, sidewalks, you can pave the streets with gold. But until you fix those schools, no one's going to buy a home. And that crystallized for me that you really can't build a healthy city without healthy schools. And that's why we did Max for Kids. That, his comment became the foundation for what became Max for Kids. Since, uh, since the voters let me know they'd really rather have me go back to business, uh, I'm in the real estate development business. And we're getting ready to break ground on a 150-acre uh, mixed-use urban neighborhood down south of the river in the worst demographic in Oklahoma City. It's going to be called the Wheeler District. You can't do that without a great school. And so we started John Rex, Bob, Bob Ross, and, and Larry Nichols, and I started John Rex Charter Elementary School in downtown. We're now in our third year. Uh, one of the school board members said, well, why don't you build it and no one comes? I said, well, you have to build it anyway. The voters approved it, but if no one comes, then you're right. You got to build it. He said, "Well, what if you build it? Too many people come." I said, "Well, that's what I think will happen. And if we have too many people, then we'll do it again." And so we've done it with John Rex. Today we have 460 students in John Rex, pre-K through four, and a waiting list of 180 students with children at every grade level waiting to get into the school. For the first time in five decades, we have families moving to the central city because of the schools instead of moving away from it because of John Rex. And so now we plan to have an English Spanish dual immersion down in Wheeler District, elementary school. We've been approved by the school board to amend our charter to go through grade eight, and we plan to keep going through grade 12. And so we're trying to build, if I can put it this way, a charter district in the central part of our city to show that you can have a successful path pre-K through 12 in the city. Our speaker today deals with these issues, and he's an expert at it. Mark Danielson is Associate Professor of Management, Business Management at North Carolina State University. He earned his PhD from the University of Florida, and his research interests include financial markets, real estate, and urban development. He's a CPA, and he's a co-author one of the world's best-selling finance textbooks, now in its 16th edition, titled Foundations of Financial Management. His academic research has appeared in leading academic finance and real estate journals. So Dr. Danielson is also the founder of Environmentalist for Educational Reform. You can see their website here, thegreenapples.org, so you can get more information on that. He also has a TED Talk online on this topic. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Bart Danielson? Uh, the, I'm at NC State University. Before I was at NC State, I actually was at DePaul University in downtown Chicago. Now, DePaul was a good place to be a finance professor. I'd walk by the Board of Trade, the options exchange every day. I, my research was mostly related to derivatives. Um, but I didn't live in Chicago. I actually lived out in Naperville, Illinois, which is 30 miles away. And why did I live in Naperville? Well, I had three kids, and the schools in Naperville are really good. And so I made that 30-mile commute each direction on a daily basis. Uh, now, I'm not the only one doing that. All right? There are a lot of people making that commute. Around the country, there are literally millions of people doing this. Uh, now, after seven years, I had, you know, I, I had tenure. Um, and, uh, but I also had diabetes. It turns out that long commutes are a risk factor for diabetes, for high blood pressure, for cardiovascular disease. And so I concluded uh, that while I liked my job and I liked where I lived, they just weren't close enough together and I was gonna have to do something different. And so that's how I ended up in North Carolina. Now, well, I mentioned that, that uh, a lot of people are making that commute. Naperville schools are pretty good. Uh, you, can, you can get a picture of this by looking at some data. In the U.S., 
across the, the census, okay, they're about the same number of zero to four year olds as five to nine year olds. They're both five year cohorts. Not true in Chicago. In Chicago, there are actually 11% fewer five to nine year olds than zero to four year olds. And out in Naperville where I lived, there are 39% more five to nine year olds than zero to four year olds. So as families, I could look around my neighborhood in June, July, and August, if you saw a moving truck in the driveway, there was about a 60% chance there was gonna be a five year old in the family that was coming in. Um, over time, that's had a devastating effect on Chicago. Chicago uh, closed 50 public schools uh, a couple of years ago. And, uh, uh, and so, and this bleeds over into many, many other social problems that Chicago has. Now, this is a phenomenon that is referred to as voting with your feet, this choosing where to live by, or choosing your schools by choosing where to live. Voting with your feet. Politicians draw lines on the ground, and then people choose their schools by choosing where to live. That's the voting with your feet piece. This results in what economists refer to as spatial sorting. So spatial sorting essentially is a situation where people move in such a way that one area ends up with good schools, with higher property values, and with higher income residents. Across the line, other schools are poor with poor students and with low property values. Over time, this, is a, uh, this creates real problems for the poor and, res and results in concentrated poverty. Now we got rid of the poll tax back in the 1960s, 1950s. You don't have to pay to vote in elections, but you still have to pay to vote with your feet. And if you can't afford to vote, you end up on the side of the line with other people who can't afford to vote. So who gets the worst schools? Well, poor people get the worst schools, but not just the poor, and this is what is really, really important to understand. Anybody who lives around poor people get those schools. So a family that has a child approaching age five, if they care about education, they literally have no choice but to leave the poor behind. This results in economic and often racial segregation. It's bad for the poor. It's even worse because the poor face something referred to as a spatial mismatch. Poor people want jobs but the jobs end up being created in the areas where the middle class and the wealthy live because that's where the money's being spent. The poor want jobs, they can't get to them. Over time, this, has, this reduces social mobility. You can't step, take that first step on the ladder of success into the middle class. Many poor people don't even know anybody in the middle class. Over time, that increases social, uh, decreases social mobility and, and increases economic inequality. Now, the problem's worse because we don't vote with our feet. All right? It's a relatively modern invention. This idea of assigning people to schools based on where they live predates the automobile. Right? But the automobile is really important to our life today. So today, people vote over much longer distances than our grandparents could ever have imagined anybody would vote. Education has become more important and our means of moving to where the education is best have gotten better. As a result, we get more suburban sprawl, also more concentrated urban blight. There's more traffic on the roads. What do we do when there's a lot of traffic? Well, build more roads. It creates more air pollution, more CO2 emissions. Now, I don't want to pick on Chicago Chicago's not the worst place in the country for this family flight rate. This problem exists in every major city in the country. Right? This is just a representative sample of a few of them. Some people look at this list and they see Atlanta there on the list and they're a little surprised. They held the Olympics in Atlanta because Atlanta's up and coming. Uh, what's, what's going on there uh, with, the, with Atlanta? Well, if I lived there for a while. If you look at what's really happening in Atlanta, here's a map, okay? Here's a map of population changes between the last two censuses. The area in brown lost more than 5% of its population. The area in purple grew by more than 15%, as did the traffic out in the suburbs. 
the, the, this is a statistic that really shocks people. Atlanta, the city of Atlanta itself has fewer people living in it today than lived there in 1966 when the Atlanta Braves moved to Atlanta. They moved to a stadium at that little black star. Now, if you ever want to see the Braves play in Atlanta, you're too late. All right, because next year they're moving to the suburbs. They said, that's where our fans are. Once a city loses its middle class, it begins to lose the people that depend upon them, or the businesses that depend upon the middle class. So there are literally hundreds of people that have jobs, had jobs, related to activities around that stadium on game day. But as of a few weeks ago, they're spatially mismatched from those jobs, as the jobs go to the suburbs. Now, you know, my kids are on Facebook a good bit. I happen, I've seen, every now and then I'll see, I, I don't get on it very much, but I know people like selfies. So I figured we ought to do a selfie here. Let's look at, let's look at what's going on here. So here's a map of, of uh, Oklahoma County. And I'll put on top of that a map showing the school districts, okay, in the county. Now this next visual is going to show that family flight rate, which is the number of excess or missing five to nine year olds relative to zero to four year olds. The red areas are between five and minus five and minus 15 percent, meaning you're missing five to 15 percent of what you would expect to have there. The dark red areas are worse than minus 15 percent. And what you'll see is that the area around the Oklahoma uh, City Public School System is filled with red. Right? This probably, none of this probably surprises you, you just haven't seen this visual in this way. And these are all done by census tracts. Now, it's not just at the five to nine year old. This is data taken from uh, this year. This is school district enrollment students per grade. The red line is the number of children in the Oklahoma City school system. The green is the Edmond school system. So you'll see back in, in kindergarten, there are about two and a half times as many children in the Oklahoma City public school system. By the time you get to the 12th grade, there are more children in the 12th grade out at Edmond. What's, what's happening here isn't just that people move out. It's that when people move to Oklahoma City, if they have children, they won't come into the district. They're gonna move into some other district. So that's sort of the situation as it exists, but here's the thing, there are other models. There are other ways to do things. There are systems that don't rely upon assignments, don't rely on lines on the ground, and there are schools that don't rely upon assignments. So let's look at one of them, all right, Vermont. Vermont's got 200 school districts. 93 of them don't have a public school. No public school at all. Now, what do you do in a district that doesn't have a public school? Well, they have a system called tuitioning. Essentially, the district will give the parents a scholarship to pay for the child to go to any independent, i.e. private school that they want to go to, or actually they can't go to a religious private school in, in Vermont as of about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, but to a private school, or they can go to a public school in a nearby district if they want to. This is for schools both in the state and outside the state. There are children attending schools in Massachusetts, in New Hampshire, in New York. In the past, there have been children on the northern border there that have gone to school in Canada on a Vermont uh, scholarship, tuition scholarship. Now that's, a, that's ignoring a line, a really big line, a national border, okay? So what does this mean at the district level? Well, the Winhall School District, 15 years ago, they had a poorly performing district. Um, they had 36 students in the school, and uh, they spent 180% of the state average, and they had a traditional public school district. Okay? So it's not a lot of people, it's a fairly rural area, but the number of students had declined significantly over time, and they were unhappy with the schools, and they did something pretty remarkable. The township voted to close the school, give the building to a not-for-profit independent school and switch to the tuitioning system. So what happened? Well, here we are 
17 years later, right, students in the district are performing above the state average. It's, the district has grown 80 students uh, at the school recently, and they spend 80, only 82% of the state average. They're doing a lot more with a lot less. <coughs> Moreover, that family flight rate is now plus 14% there. People are actually moving in when they have children hitting school age. Now, we did a study published in the Journal of Housing Research that looks at this more globally. Uh, so let's consider that we wanted to know what's the economic impact? How do we gauge economic impact, perhaps, of, the, of, the, of these tuitioning districts? So consider a, uh, a situation where you have three districts. What, uh, school A, uh, or Home A, is in a better school district than Home B. B's school isn't as good as A's school. Home C is in a tuitioning district. They don't have an assigned school at all. Right? Studies in the past will tell you that home A is going to be worth more than home B, but what about home C? Right? Well, home C that's in the district without an assigned school at all actually has higher property values in, than the average for the state, but if you compare it to home B, the places that have relatively weak public schools, home C is worth about $24,000 more on average than home B. Because, in home, because home B is assigned to a weak school and home C can go wherever they want to. Now, after this was published, um, it got a little bit of play up in Vermont and I, I actually got an email from somebody who sent down from a local newspaper, this from the Caledonian Record, uh, East Haven, school choice leads to real estate boom growing pains. So East Haven had a school district that also had shrunk. It had shrunk to the point that they decide, decided they just needed to close the school and there wasn't anybody that wanted to start a private school in it, but they tuitioned to, to nearby districts that, that uh, wherever the people wanted to go. They had declined <clears throat> over the last decade from 60 students down to only about 13 when they closed the school. Right? Within three years, the next year it immediately the number of kids in the area started to go up. And uh, now it's up to almost 30 students, right? after years and years of going the opposite direction. Now, there aren't a lot of places, there are some places abroad. Paris has an interesting system that has both an assigned school system as well as a, a tuitioning type system layered on top of it. But there aren't a lot of places in the US that have a, a system like Vermont. But there are a lot of schools Right, that don't have uh, assignment areas. Uh, we got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to study one of these, the Orange County School of the Arts in, in, uh, uh, in Santa Ana, California. It was started by the guy there in the, in the middle. His name's Ralph Opasic. Ralph uh, was, uh, went to high school with me in Virginia. And, uh, and we reconnected over time and he turned out he had started this school. So, Ralph was really passionate about the arts when he graduated from, from college. Um, for, he thought he was going to maybe be Billy Joel, but it turns out there's not room for a lot of Billy Joels. And, he, and so he got a job part-time, or full-time as it turned out, as the <laughs> choir director at the uh, Los Alamitos High School. Um, he did some other things, but he was the choir director. There, was, there were 30 kids in the choir. In three years, there were 350 kids in the choir. He was really good at what he did. And he used that local acclaim to start the Orange County School of the Arts, which was affiliated there with Los Alamitos High School. And as you might expect, given his past record, it was successful and they needed to grow. And at that point, something interesting happened. The city council said, uh, we're not sure we want you to grow. Um, you know, you're bringing these kids in from over the line. And that family flight rate in Los Alamitos was plus 24%. So things were working pretty well with the lines for them. And, uh, and so they, they basically said, no, we're not, we don't want you to grow. We're not sure we even want you here. And that's how the uh, Orange County School of the Arts ended up moving from Los Alamitos to Santa Ana. The mayor of Santa Ana, a guy named Miguel Polito, called Ralph up and said, Ralph, I don't know why they don't want you. They say you're Create, going to create traffic problems there. We wish we had traffic problems. You can roll a bowling ball down Main Street around here. If you're willing to come here, we'll help to get you into some of this empty space downtown. 
And so the Orange County School of the Arts at that point became a charter school and moved to Santa Ana, California. And it was really actually a very good thing. It was a good thing for Santa Ana. It was a good thing for the Orange County School of the Arts. They moved into an, to an, an empty bank building, right? But there was a lot of empty real estate in downtown Santa Ana. And as they expanded, they acquired a couple of other bank buildings, an old church, it had a stage in the front, really nice for a school of the arts. They were able to continue to expand. The, now the mayor in Santa Ana was visionary. And he said, you know, I've got a big problem here. Uh, and they brought in two other charter schools. Today, within two blocks of Main Street in Santa Ana, there are 3,500 kids going to school, plus all the people that are working at those schools. Now, as a, as a guy who teaches real estate, one of the things that's very interesting to me is that empty block right there. Because a developer has already broken ground there to build that, which would be the tallest building in all of Orange County, California. Right. This area is no longer blighted. I was down there uh, looking down Main Street on a, at noon one day, and you can see there's a tremendous amount of activity. Uh, it's not blighted unless you really dislike teenagers. One of the things the mayor noted was, you know, the crime rate dropped dramatically there. Um, now, I kind of blew that off initially because I, that's not my area of research. And I, I, you know, I know that, no offense, but some politicians will puff things up a little bit. And uh, so uh, I, I, I didn't think about it very much until at a later point I saw that there had actually been a study. And there's a study right now of the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program, which is basically a voucher program, a tuitioning program, um, that in the early years there were too many spot, there were too many students applying for the number of spots available, so they had to have a lottery. And when they had this lottery, what they did is, is some people that applied got into the program and some didn't. These researchers tracked over the next seven years the crime rates of the students that applied. And what they found was that the lottery winners committed fewer crimes subsequently than the kids that applied but didn't get into the law, did, 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 weren't, weren't allowed to, to actually participate in the program. And they found the results were concentrated in minority males that were 17% less likely to commit crimes. Now there have actually been two other studies that find even bigger results than that. Among, and, and the real impact appears to be among minority males. That's where the, all three of these studies found the, the results, really. Nevertheless, Santa Ana is the poorest uh, town in Orange County, California, and it's 90% minority. Right? With that in mind, I still find it kind of surprising that Forbes magazine back three years ago rated Santa Ana the fourth safest city in the country. Something really dramatic changed there. Now, the, the study that we did here is based upon, a, 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 or the study that we're doing for the National Endowment for, for the Arts is based upon a study that we did uh, on a charter school in uh, North Carolina that's published in Real Estate Economics. It's called It Makes a Village Residential Relocation After Charter School Admission. Here, we wanted to try to figure out, well, what's the impact that this charter school is having on the area? And it's kind of hard to do that we hit on the idea of let's look at where the families that are lit going to that school, how did they move over time? And so this video, this is in Wake Forest, North Carolina, this video shows that dark spot is the school's location and all these other dots are families that enrolled a child and then later moved. You can see why we call it, it makes a village. That school is powerfully attractive. Right? It'll bounce back to where they started and then where they finished. Okay. There have been studies that look at um, how people move relative to work. We know people like to move closer to work when they can. Uh, we just substituted the kids work location in to that, those methodologies. That school was more attractive than any study we could find related to work locations. People care more about their kids commute than their own apparently. 
If you want to bring pe people who care about education into an area, you need to use the right bait. And I think you're looking at at least one form of the right bait. Now, there's some other examples. This is in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I live. Uh, a charter school started in that building in the back in a blighted area. You can tell the area is blighted. There's no roof on the building next door. Okay. Five years after that school started, a developer came in, developed property immediately adjacent to it, marketing proximity to that school. That, you see the railroad tracks up there above it. It literally turned the wrong side of the tracks into the right side of the tracks. Developers in general are beginning to catch on to this. Down in, in uh, Panama City, Florida, they had an old airport. They wanted, uh, they, they built a bigger one, a better one that Southwest Airlines could fly into so that people from Oklahoma City could fly down there to the beach more easily. Um, the, uh, they closed the 700 acre airport that was three miles from town and wanted mixed use development built that. So a developer acquired that property to build mixed use development. He had a problem. Schools in Panama City aren't very good. But he took a page out of the Santa Ana story and the, at the airport there, there was an old terminal. They repurposed that building, not a bank building, but repurposed the airport terminal, which is now University Academy, okay? They, they partnered with uh, Florida State University in Panama City that helped develop the curriculum. And uh, one of the things I'll note here is they were concerned about the fact that once they built this school, it might fill up with people not in their neighborhood. They wanted to use this as a mechanism for selling houses in the neighborhood. And, and so they were concerned about that. They got a law change which I think was really interesting and creative. The law change that they got was if a developer in Florida builds a charter school, they can reserve one half of the seats in the charter school for kids in the neighborhood and half of the seats for people outside. So they built the school, nothing else on the land. Right? They had 300 and some, in the third year they had 300 and some students in the school, 1,000 kids on the waiting list. And they just broke ground in the front of the school with the, uh, with, with the first houses going in. Uh, they're going to make a fortune. Right? That people jump that queue if they move into the neighborhood. But they've given literally hundreds of people outside the neighborhood the same option. So it's a very interesting innovation. Now, what should communities in general learn from this? Well. One of the things I would argue that we ought to be considering is I refer to it here as community protection. Whoop. Community protection and revitalization scholarships. What is that? Well, that's a long name, so let's just call them CPR scholarships. You've heard of CPR. You don't have to give it to everybody but you give it to people who are dying, okay? You don't have to give CPR scholarships to every, everywhere, but you need to give it to the places that are dying. And those are places of concentrated poverty where people are moving out when they have children hitting school age, right? In those areas, all children should get tuitioning, like the Vermont model, right? You give it to the poor for social justice reasons. They're burdened with bad schools. You give it to people who aren't poor in order to give them a reason to live near the poor. The poor need middle income people to be willing to live near them because they're the ones that bring jobs, social stability. What would CPR scholarships do? They would improve the local economy there, fight blight and sprawl, reduce air pollution and CO2 emissions from the commuting, reduce crime, reduce economic segregation, decrease income inequality, increase social mobility, reduce infrastructure costs, you don't have to build the roads, improve public health, people aren't sitting in their cars at the end of the day commuting for an hour on top of a sedentary job. And in some places they would protect public employee pensions. I don't know how Oklahoma works. There are some places in which municipal pensions are not insured by the state. There are some places where the teachers' pensions are insured by the state, but other municipal workers, police, firefighters, other municipal workers are not. Have no idea what that situation is here. 
So let me quickly summarize. Politicians draw lines on the ground, they divide people. Then people vote with their feet, that creates sprawl and blight, which creates pollution, concentrated poverty, and social division. Now, one thing that has happened fairly recently, I think is worth noting, HUD announced the final rules referred to affirmatively furthering fair housing. What is that? Well, the goal is to move subsidized housing into, quote, areas rich with opportunity. Basically, in, in general, that means moving subsidized housing out of urban areas and into suburban areas. Now, it, it may have some success. My guess is it'll be limited because it's not a very sustainable kind of policy. Here's the problem. Areas rich with opportunities are areas rich. It is difficult to spend enough money to subsidize moving people into an area where the cost of acquiring the property is high. Now, there's another issue with this, which is, if you know this narrative, all right, the concentrated poverty is a symptom of a problem that starts elsewhere. If you focus your attention on dealing with a symptom, it'll frequently come back. The spatial sorting is gonna continue. It's going on all the time. If you wanna deal with the symptom, you need to target the underlying cause. If you deal with that problem, then the other issues begin to fade away on their own. Now, I'm actually very optimistic because as the mayor mentioned earlier, young people like living in cities. They move there after they finish school, they meet people, they fall in love, they get married, they have kids. And then when their child gets to be five years old, they're confronted with the question, right? What, what, can, we, what, what can we choose? What will we choose? It's an important question. And the answer depends upon what they're allowed to choose. Um, I'm very optimistic that if you get the policies right, this will change, these things can change in a hurry because people have a reason to want to be in urban areas anyway. Appreciate your time.